So our final unit is the ecology unit. And ecology is essentially the study of organisms and their interactions with one another, as well as with the environment. And this is really kind of different from what we've been talking about. We've talked about evolution, and we've talked about organisms on an individual level, plants, fungi, protists, animals. But now the last unit is really tying that all together. You know, how does this all fit into the world? But we can't look at the whole world all at once. And so what biologists do is we actually break up the world and break up those interactions into different organizational levels. So instead of someone saying, I'm a biologist, they might say, I'm a population biologist or an ecosystem biologist. There are tons of organization levels. We can go all the way down to an atom, uh, but we're going to talk more big stuff. So from smallest to largest, and we'll talk about these individually, we have a multicellular organism, which is really what we've been focusing on in the past few units. We have a population, a community, an ecosystem, and finally the biggest level, which is the biosphere. So let's take a look at each of these individually. So the first one I'll kind of briefly talk about is a multicellular organism. So essentially a plant or an animal. I guess technically you could have biologists who study protists, but typically we're talking about plants and animals. We have talked extensively about this level. That's really all we've been doing this whole semester. When we're looking at this level, what we mean is we're actually studying that species. And we're not studying interactions, it's more of understanding what's happening within that organism. You know, what is happening within the shark? We know it's made of cartilage. We know uh, that they have gills. Uh, we know they can uh, reproduce with eggs or with live young. So a biologist who's studying the multicellular organism, they're looking uh, usually internally. What is happening physically in that body? And that's pretty much all I'm going to talk about because, again, we've really focused on this quite a bit. The next level up is a population, and this is what we're going to be studying for the first part of this unit. So a population, we use this term quite a bit. We say the human population. A population can apply to humans, but it can apply to really any living organism. All it means, it's a group of members of the same species. So for example, we have these dolphins right here. They are in a dolphin pod. We would refer to this as a population of dolphins. Uh, this is a school of fish. Again, that school would be referred to uh, as a group or a population. Now it's really easy to think of just animals, but this applies to plants as well. So here's an example of kelp in a kelp forest. Well, that is a population of kelp. Now soon, we'll talk about uh, estimating population sizes, and next week we're going to talk a little bit about how populations change in, over time. But just kind of want to give you an idea, we're just talking about uh, just one species. At the community level, we're just going to be looking at the interactions between species, and we'll focus on this uh, later next week. And so by species interactions, it could be something like you see in this picture. It could be predator and prey, although it's not a positive interaction, it's an interaction. It could be an interaction where both organisms are benefiting. It could be a parasitic interaction. So there's lots of different interactions. It could even be things like competition. So how is one organism coexisting or attacking or interacting with another organism? And we're in, in this unit, we're going to dive more into those different types of interactions that we see between organisms. The next level up, so as you can see, we're kind of including more and more stuff, is an ecosystem. An ecosystem is a community, so all the organisms and their interactions, and the physical environment. How is the physical environment changing or affecting? affecting those interactions and those organisms. Now, because we have these two different things in our ecosystem, we've got the collection of organisms, and we've got the environment, we actually have some scientific words we can use to describe those different components. So one component is biotic. You see this bio root, you know bio means life. 
So biotic, this is referring to all the living things in that ecosystem. The trees, the bacteria, the you know dolphins and fish and corals and all the different organisms that we've learned about. So that's living. But as I mentioned before, it's things in the environment as well. So we call those non-living things abiotic components or abiotic factors. That a, that root, means none or without. So these are things without life, but they're still important. We still need them. For example, in this rainforest, the diversity in the rainforest would not be that way if we didn't have rain. Well, rain or water is not living, but it's needed. And how much water, whether you have a lot in a rainforest, whether you have none in a desert, or whether you are underwater, makes a huge impact on the diversity of organisms in that environment. Some other examples of abiotic factors would be things like nutrients. So plants need nutrients in the soil. Different animals need shelter, especially thinking about the desert that you need somewhere to hide when it's really, really hot outside. You need things like sunlight, uh, but also things like temperature. Temperature, although it's not something you hold on to, it's still abiotic. It's still non-living, and it still affects what organisms are living there. So in this uh, unit, we'll briefly touch on ecosystems. We're really going to focus on populations and communities. So scientists studying at the ecosystem level, they're kind of looking at maybe migration patterns, which are usually stimulated by sunlight or by uh, temperature. Or they're studying the rainforest as a whole, the nutrient cycling in a rainforest, etc. And then finally, we have the biosphere. And you could literally break down the word biosphere. It's life, you know, sphere, this shape, this globe. We're referring to Earth. There are some processes that affect Earth as a whole. It might affect Earth differently, like climate change or ocean acidification, but that's Earth. That's everything. If I'm studying climate change, I, I'm not looking at just one organism or one process. I'm looking at all the interactions that happen on Earth. So the biosphere level is like really, really big issues that are affecting a lot of organisms around the world, whether it's being affected the same or being affected differently. So those five levels, you'll hear about a little bit more. We're going to focus on in this unit on two of them. We're going to focus on the populations, and we're also going to focus on communities. Now remember, a population is a series of organisms that are all the same species in an area. So for example, uh, this is a rock somewhere. These are our barnacles. Barnacles are a living organism. That's the only species we see here. We would say that this is a population of barnacles. And within our populations, we can study a whole bunch of different things. How are they growing? How are they changing? How do members interact with one another? How does you know mating rituals happen? For some of your species spotlight groups, you guys actually were looking at population biology. You talked about how males found females. You talked about the mating rituals they had. That's all part of population biology. So the first thing we'll talk about is how they're dispersed. So a population is not referring to the entire species. You usually wouldn't say a population of tigers and be referring to all tigers in the world. Typically, you're looking at a, a population of tigers. And so the question is, is you know, how, how are tigers dispersed on a landscape? How is a kelp forest dispersed in a landscape? Are they the same everywhere? Randomly dispersed? Clumped? And so that's what we're going to be taking a look at. We're going to talk about each of these three. So for example, in clumped and uniform and random, each of those green dots represents one individual. But as you can see, like here, I can actually see distinct populations. Here is one group of tigers and here is another group of tigers. Not all species do this though. Here you see something that's uniform or random. So when I'm talking about dispersion, we're really talking about where are these organisms located in relation to one another? Is there space between them? Do they just kind of all disperse in the environment? Are they territorial, etc.? So the first one we'll talk about is clumped. 
And I highly recommend these graphs or these images you see on the previous page to kind of sketch those out with each of these different dispersion patterns that we talk about. So the first one is clumped, and the reason we'll talk about this one first, it's the most common. This is what we see. Humans are clumped. We're clumped in really big cities. Now, of course, we got people who live in the middle of nowhere, but for the most part, we're clumped. There's a whole bunch of reasons why organisms do this, why humans do this, why fish do this, why dolphins do this. Uh, one reason can be socially. So for example, dolphins. Uh, dolphins need to be around one another. Uh, humans, for the most part, we need to be around one another. We would die in isolation because we need that interaction with other organisms. So same thing with dolphins, with whales, uh, with chimpanzees. Uh, so that's one reason why clumped uh, is seen so often. It could also be seen due to reproduction. So it's much easier to reproduce with other members of your species if you are around other members of your species. It can also be used for feeding. So going back to dolphins, uh, dolphins will work together to feed on a school of fish. Uh, and it's really fascinating uh, watching them do this. Some shark species do this as well. And then related to feeding, if you're the one being fed upon, there literally is a safety in numbers. And that's what you see in this image here of the school of fish. Fish make these dense schools for safety. It's actually interesting because you would think as a fish, you want to be in the center of the school, right? You are the furthest from the outside. Nothing is going to come eat you. But that's actually wrong. I'm not saying you want to be on the outside either. You're right. If you're on the outside, you're dead. You kind of want to be somewhere between the center and the outside. And the reason for that is because at the very middle of the school, there's actually very little oxygen. And these guys I can actually suffocate and die from being in the middle. You have all these fish on the outside of your school, all of them taking oxygen out of the water, which means less oxygen is available to those fish in the middle. So fun fact for you, but you should definitely write that down. Um, so not only fish, but a lot of smaller organisms are going to be uh, in large groups for safety. There is a, a great predator defense. Think about anthills. You know, if you've ever stepped on an anthill or the sort, like, you know, they all work together to screw you over. Uh, so it, it provides a lot of safety. And so we see this a lot in nature. Now, this is related to animals, but plants are dispersed across the landscape as well. So one example uh, or one reason why plants might be found clumped is depending on their seed dispersal. You know, some plants literally just drop their seeds like right below them. And there's not much opportunity for those seeds to move further. So they drop their seeds and it doesn't fall <laughs> it doesn't fall far from the tree. Which means that if it does grow, if it does germinate, it's right next to another tree. And so this tree grows, it drops its seeds. Well, those seeds are all around that tree. There's really very little opportunity for those seeds to disperse uh, across a wider landscape. Uh, so just an example of how we could see this clumped dispersion in our plant species. So go ahead and pause here and take a look at this video. Uh, this video, uh, on YouTube is looking at a school of fish and it's just kind of amazing what these schools look like. Uh, so getting an idea of what this clumped dispersion looks like. So pause here, click this link, and then come back afterwards. The next type of dispersion we have is uniform. So uniform dispersion, we see this in animals that are territorial. So they want to be in a group, but they don't. Maybe they want to be in a group for reproduction uh, or for safety, but within their group, uh, they're dispersed uh, very, very uh, evenly apart. So that's what we mean by uniform, is evenly spaced apart. Now, penguins are kind of a weird one because they are clumped, but within their clump, they're uniform. But a lot of the big cats, uh, jaguars, for example, they defend a territory, and a lot of their territories are about the same size. So they're defending this territory, 
and there's a certain amount of space between them and the next territory and the next territory and the next territory. They're not clumped together. They are evenly spaced apart from one another. And so you kind of see this here. In plants, we also see uniform uh, dispersion. It's a little bit rarer. But for example, the black walnut tree. The black walnut tree releases poisons and toxin out of its roots. And the point of those toxins is to infect uh, other plants and kill other plants so that that individual tree is not competing for sunlight, competing for water, competing for nutrients. But even another black walnut tree would actually also be infected and harmed by those toxins. So nothing can grow around a black walnut tree. But the second those toxins get a little bit lighter and kind of fade away, the seeds that black walnut is dropping, if it lands just outside of that mark, well, it can land and germinate and grow. And it's maybe, it takes three feet for that to happen. Well, that new black walnut tree does the same thing. It grows, releases toxins, drops its seeds, and only the seeds that are at least three feet away from the tree can grow. And so we're seeing this more as a, you can almost think of it as a black walnut tree territory. They want to defend their space. Same thing with animals with territories, which is causing this even dispersion. If you take a look at this video, uh, you'll actually see another example of a bird that has territories. And this video does a good job at kind of outlining what those territories look like. And you can tell they're similar in size. So go ahead and pause here and click on this link that's popping up and then come back here uh, to continue on with the lecture. Last but not least, we have random dispersion. And random dispersion happens when the reproductive material of that organism is released into the environment. So for example, a dandelion. A dandelion's seeds do not drop right below it. A dandelion does not release uh, any toxins to make it uniform at all. Instead, you just blow on it and they go. The seeds just fly away somewhere. Maybe they'll land in a clump. Maybe they'll be uniform across each other. Maybe they'll be here and they'll be here. It's all random. Like, we don't know. The wind is literally taking the seeds. Who knows where it'll be? So an example of reproductive material just being released into the environment uh, with no rhyme or reason for it. This also happens in the environment. So looking at most things in the ocean, a lot of organisms release sperm and egg directly into the water. And the hope is that that sperm will find an egg and make a baby and that baby grows up. But where that baby ends up growing up, who knows? It could be close by, it could be far away, they never see their parents again, we don't know. Now maybe as adults they might find one another and clump with one another, but for the most part, a majority of their life is spent just randomly dispersed in the ocean until they find other organisms of their species. Uh, but they didn't start that way. There are other species, uh, if you look at clams and oysters, if you have the right substrate, they'll kind of be uh, all over the place because they just release their stuff into the environment. So of these three different dispersion patterns, the most common one that you're looking at is our clumped. Random and uniform are kind of both on the same page as far as the number of different species that show that kind of dispersion. And as a population biologist, this might be important to you. You know, if you're trying to estimate the size of the jaguar community, if you can only find five, but they are all five miles apart from each other, you might be able to say, well, here's some very similar habitat. If you keep going that way, I'm sure if I were to go another five miles, I'd probably find another one. So it can help predict where organisms can be found. Another thing you may be wondering, or kind of a really anyone wondering it's just how big is that population right is that population growing is it declining is it staying the same is it a lot is it a little are they going endangered knowing how large a population is is incredibly important I mean humans are kind of obsessed with this we're really obsessed with the human population 
we're at like 7.5 billion people. We're also kind of obsessed with how many animals there are. There's, you know, 20,000 orangutans left in the world. There's, you know, a million of these uh, pelicans in the world. We like knowing how large populations are, and we can grab a lot of information from that. So let's say I give you this picture. How many penguins are there? Yeah, right? Like, I, I don't expect you to actually count that. <laughs> that will not be on the review quiz. But who knows, right? Um, I, I, could, I could spend my entire day measuring that. I could sit here and go one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. But that is not viable. That doesn't make sense to do. I'd be wasting my time. And as a researcher, as a scientist, you're also wasting money spending so much time to estimate a population, especially something as big as this. So what do we do then? You know, like how, how do we make this more manageable? So one thing we can do is we can grid this off. We can use a grid and instead of counting every single penguin in this colony, instead we can count some of these boxes. You know, I can count the number of penguins in this box or the number of penguins in this box or in this box. Now you can see this image is not um, equal. You only have a couple penguins in the front because they're closer, so they're bigger, and you've got a lot more in the back. Also, these grids are half penguin, half picture, so that's not uh, really even either. So you have to kind of develop some rules for this. So scientists actually do this all the time. They will grid off their ecosystem, they will grid off their population, and then they choose uh, a random box to count, or multiple boxes. Typically, your goal is to measure 10% of the area. So for example, we've got seven by six, that's 42 boxes. So we should count four to five boxes. Now the boxes you count should be random. I don't wanna take the easy way. If I were to count these five boxes, well, that's not gonna be really accurate of my ecosystem. If I count, you know, these five boxes, that also won't be accurate. And so what scientists will do, and you've kind of seen me do this, is use a random number generator. So they would make, mark each of these, this would be one, two, three, four, five, etc. And then they would use a random number generator and choose their squares that way. So for example, um, they might have chosen one, and then maybe the number like 10, I don't know what these are. This one came up, this one came up, and this one came up. Whatever the number generator said. Because it's random. You, the researcher, have bias. Hell yeah, I'm lazy. I want to record these down here. It's going to be so much easier. But that's not accurate. And we're trying to be as accurate as possible. So we are just randomly choosing places and not trying to choose things that are interesting, things that are easy, things that are difficult. We're trying to get a mix of everything. So that's one way scientists will measure the size of a population. And again, a lot of the reasons we do this is because we're interested in how the population changes. For example, this researcher is looking at coral and is looking at the coral dying. And so here they have this grid uh, and they're doing the same thing for this grid. They are looking at the percentage of dead coral in each of those boxes. But they're not going to count every single box. Instead, they're going to count this box and say, oh, okay. Within this box, a really good estimate is 62% of this box has dead coral in it. Or, you know, this has, you know, 21% dead coral. Uh, so they're kind of using this to see over time, like, how is our habitat changing? How are organisms changing because of that? That's uh, so a really, really important skill to have to be able to estimate populations because it's not something you do once and that's it. Yeah, coral's good. We don't do that. We measure it multiple times to see how things change. So that's great if you have a really big population or you have a population that's sessile, so isn't moving. Those penguins, they're breeding. They're not moving much. I can take a picture and start counting. But what if you're measuring something that you don't have that luxury? Let's say you're looking at migratory whales. 
you might be able to find one pot of whales and say, oh, there's eight in there. But I'm going to, I'll tell you right now, there's more than eight whales in the world. So what do you do? So we have this equation, an easy equation, so don't worry too much. We have an equation that kind of helps us determine or really estimate how large our population is. Now that, pop, uh, that equation is referred to as the mark and recapture equation. By mark, I literally mean marking it. That organism you're going to mark in some way. And that's what you see here in this picture. We have different gastropods uh, marked with different identifying numbers. We're going to release them into the wild and we're going to try to recapture them. And depending on how many we recapture will be uh, how many or will help us with our estimate of how many we think there are. Uh, so briefly, talk about it more in a second, but briefly, we're going to sample the population once. I went out, I saw that pod of eight whales, and I marked them. And we'll talk about how to mark them in a little bit. Then I release them. And I go back the next day, and I sample again, and oh, I found a pod with ten whales, and oh, there's actually three whales that are marked the day before. And that's what gives us the clue and gives us the ability to estimate the population size. So let's walk through an example of how to use this equation. So I'm going to give you the equation first, and I'll kind of explain it, and explain it more as we talk about the example. So the equation which I, uh, which I would give you, but I want to tell you what it means, uh, is m over n equals r over t. If you like um, simplifying things, you can, but I keep it in this form for a reason because I think it's easier to remember what everything is for a reason. So as I mentioned, the first thing you're going to do is you're going to go out and you're going to sample. So I went out and I saw those eight whales. M are the ones that we marked. These are the ones I originally saw and I marked them. So I'm just going to write in this eight. T is the number that I saw the second time around. So in my example, I went out, saw eight the first day, came back home. Uh, the next day I go out and I found 11 whales. Well, of those 11 whales, I only saw three. And that's what the R is. R is for recapture. So M is for marked. R is how many I recaptured the second time. Uh, so T for time. And we are solving for N. We are solving for the number are really, in this case, our estimate of the number of organisms in this species. So to solve this, you can cross multiply. So 8 times 11 is 88 equals um, 3 times n. And n equals, uh, that should be, so that should be about 29.66. Let me check that real quick. Uh, so let's see, 88 divided by 3. Yep, 20, oh, I was close. 29.33. Well, we don't have 29.33 whales, so in actuality, this is 30, right? I'm not estimating I have 29 and a third whale. Uh, I'm estimating I have 30 whales. And that's really important when we're talking about these population calculations because it's important to note that, yeah, I recognize there is not a partial whale out there. Now the way this equation works, a way to remember it, because you're like, I don't want to remember what M means and N and R and T. The way it works is we marked eight individuals. And when we go out the second day, we're actually creating a ratio. We're saying, hey, for every 11 that we found, three of them were ones we've seen before. And so if you go back to the left side of this equation, we're saying, oh, well, there's eight we've seen before. How, what is this number? You know, how many were there? And here, here's how much I'm seeing. So in this case, we're saying n is 30. This is the same proportion. 3 divided by 11 is the same thing as 8 divided by 30. We're saying that anytime you go out and see some whales, there's a certain percentage that you've already seen before. And we can use that to estimate. So this is essentially a ratio. This is saying... 
Here's how many we saw out of this many individuals. Here's how many we saw out of this many individuals. This was from our second time. This is from our first time. We're just solving how many individuals were there with this first time. So that's kind of how the equation works. Maybe that'll help you in remembering like where these different numbers go. So let's do this with a, a, a different example. Okay. So I'm going out, I'm looking for spotted salamanders. And I went out to a forest and I was looking in this one area and I was looking there for about an hour and I found seven and I marked them. And maybe I marked them by putting like a metal band on their arm or something. So I marked them and that's my M, right? M is for mark. And then I put them back in the environment to let them hang out with their friends again, to go back to their home, to eat, etc. Just want to mark them, throw them back. And I want to go out again. And so here I've marked them instead of metal bands, I got this red nail polish that I put on them. So I'm going to go out again. And I'm going to survey that same exact area again. And you also need to spend the same amount of time, right? If I'm out there one hour one day and five hours the next day, well, that's not going to be very equivalent, right? I spent four extra hours searching for them. So the same time, same area, try to keep as many variables the same as possible. And I'm going to do the same thing. I'm going to look for more salamanders. Can I find that same species of salamander? And I start looking and I'm looking and I did find them. I found four of them. And of those four, uh, one of them I've recaptured. One of them had this red dot on it or it's silver band on it. And I'm like, oh, I, I've seen this one before. So my number is four for T. That's how many caught I, that's how many I caught the second time and one for R. I only recaptured one. So what I'm saying is I went out, caught one out of four individuals. So that's what I'm going to use as my ratio. So when I go out, one I've seen before, and there was three new ones, or four total, I originally saw seven. So the question is, is what is this number? If this is one out of four, seven divided by what? Now you could do 7 times 4 equals 28 equals 1n. So this was an easy one. I can just write 28 in here. We're saying that, yeah, there was actually 28 the first time. You just happened to catch 7. And the second time, yeah, there was 4 out there. You just happened to catch one of them. So that's kind of how this equation works. Now I keep saying we can mark them, but depending on the organism, it's going to be very different how you mark them. We should not use fingernail polish on a salamander. Uh, salamanders kind of breathe and use their skin as an organ. We could use, say, nail polish on a snail. That shell doesn't allow gas exchange or anything like that, so as far as we know, won't affect them. With whales, that would be a lot of work to catch them and put a tag or a marker on them. But whales, their tail fins, like you see here, are actually very unique uh, to each individual. They uh, have a special signature similar to the fingerprint of a human. And so people doing mark and recapture with whales or following a whale pod will take pictures of their tails and kind of have a book of like, oh yeah, that's Frank. I, I, I've got that. I've seen that whale before. Oh, that's a new whale. I don't have that fingerprint in here. Some organisms, you might remove part of them uh, or the mark and recapture I've done, we cut their ear a little bit. Some organisms like mice have no nerve endings in their ear. So they actually don't feel it at all. Uh, it's like, I don't know, kind of like our ear lobes. Um, our cartilage hurts a lot, but our ear lobes for the most part, like don't really hurt when you squeeze them really tight or anything like that. Uh, so we might take a chunk out or we might cut it just to be like, yes, I've seen this one before. Some conventional tagging, like literally putting a tag on them. Or uh, what I've also seen and what I've done is literally shaving a, a qualifier uh, into the organism. So just shaving their hair a little bit just to recognize, you know what, this is organism number 22. I'm going to guarantee this animal did not have a 22 shaved into the side of them before I marked them. Uh, so just different types of techniques. It's important just to keep in mind your organism.
it doesn't make sense to paint the nails of this organism because more than likely those nails are going to fall off. You don't want to um, disturb the organism or disturb the mating rituals of an organism. So different things that scientists have to keep in mind. It's not simply, oh, we'll mark it. Like you really, really have to think about that. All right, so that's where the lecture is going to stop. Uh, I have this last example up here that you can find in the PowerPoint slides, but I'm gonna have you guys do this as homework, and then the review quiz for this lecture will have this question on it. So you can pause here and write this down, you can look at it in the slides, or you can just wait until the review quiz and take a look at it there. So thanks for watching. Definitely send me an email if you have any questions, and I'll see you guys on Monday.